Lessons from the Desert, that's the name of the, uh, that's the, name of the lesson that I have uh, that I want to share with you tonight. And uh, to begin this lesson, I just want to give some background information. I think most of you know this. Some of you have this on your study sheets. I want to talk about the Jews, the Jewish people, and pick up their history when they were in Egypt. And I think most of us know that the Jewish people spent 400 years in Egypt. And while there lived mainly as uh, shepherds and farmers in that land, and we know also that when they grew in numbers, the Egyptians enslaved them and put them uh, to hard labor making bricks in order to you know, supply their many uh, building projects. Moses eventually led them out of their bondage and was prepared to bring them to the uh, land promised to their forefathers by God. And we, as we read in the Old Testament, we see because of their rebellion and disobedience, they spent 40 long years wandering in the desert. And while they were in the desert, the Bible describes how these millions of people lived from day to day, cut off from other civilizations and every type of inhabitable land. Now we read in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers of all the various laws and rituals that governed their everyday lives while they were in the desert. For example, aside from the time spent eating and sleeping and maintaining their dwellings, the Jews' day was filled with the following duties. And I want, you to give, I want to give you an idea of what their day-to-day -day life was like. What did they do? Well, first of all, they had to maintain animals who were to be brought to the priests for the many types of sacrifices that they offered. I mean, they had to maintain those animals. They had to prepare all kinds of animal and food and perfume sacrifices on a regular basis. They, they didn't get ready-made cakes in order to bring to the priest to offer. They had to make those things. They had to personally deliver these sacrifices to the priests on a regular basis. And there were different sacrifices, a different type of sacrifice for sin, another type of sacrifice for thanksgiving, one for praise, so on and so forth. And the thought struck me, they had to wait in line. <laughs> you ever think about that? They couldn't call ahead and reserve with the priest, hey, I'm coming, I'll be there at 3.02 if you want to take my sack. No, 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 they, they had to wait in line. That took up time. They had to attend regular assemblies to receive teaching from Moses and from Aaron. They had to continually perform cleansing rites if they touched something that was considered unclean, for example, so something that was dead. And that meant they had to wash all of their clothing, had to wash themselves as well. Women had a particularly difficult time, they had to offer sacrifice after every menstrual cycle. Had to go through a whole routine after every menstrual cycle. They had to prepare acceptable food. Today we'd call it kosher, but you know, the type of food that was prescribed. They had to keep the Sabbath and participate in yearly festivals. They had to pay a tax to the priest for himself and for the children that were born to them while they were there. They had to continually break camp and then reestablish camp as the cloud over the tabernacle lifted and led them to a new location. The pillar of fire provided light at night. While they were in the desert, have you ever considered, aside from these things that they had to do from day to day, while they were in the desert, there was no commerce Nobody opened up a store. There was no commerce, there was no entertainment industry. There were no schools, no organized military, no government, no mass communication, and none of these things that were in a regular society that kept people busy. For 40 years, the Jews had only one task, and that was to serve the Lord, one task. 
They ate, they slept, they maintained their dwellings, and the rest of their time was devoted to serving God in the various ways that I've just described. You know, we say, uh, I'm going to church, or we're, we're going to do church. You know, when we say we're going to do church, what, what do we mean? Well, we're going to pile the kids in the car, drive to the church building, get in, sit down, you know, sing, lead, you know, listen to a sermon, or if we come to Bible school, get the kids into Bible class, you know, and that takes a couple hours. We did church. Did you go to church today? That, that was church. These people did church every day. That's what I'm saying. They did church every day, all day, all the time. It was all about church. Their total focus, total devotion, total consumption of time and energy invested in serving God produced some badly needed results for this particular people. Now we need to understand that the Jews were mainly pagan by the time they left Egypt. I mean, they had some vestige of faith in their patriarchs, some knowledge of them, but the influence of Egypt laid heavily upon them. I mean, they lived there for four centuries. Don't you think living in a pagan country had some kind of influence on them? They're being cut off from everything in the desert. Them being cut off from everyone in the desert was there to focus only on serving God. And that total focus helped change them from a people who believed in the God that Moses spoke of to becoming the people of God who spoke to them through Moses. In other words, they went from being, you know, thinking you know, to Moses, uh, we're listening about your God, Moses. And then it went well, he's our God, to ultimately, he's my God. That transformation had to take place while they were in the desert. And here's how that transformation took place in, you know, in steps. First of all, this, lifetime, this lifestyle kept them out of trouble. 40 years in the desert, cut off from everyone. It kept them out of trouble. Being alone in the desert kept them from fraternizing with other pagan nations and being influenced by their practices as they had been in Egypt for four centuries. The laws and the rituals that they had to continually follow also kept them busy and focused on God, so there was less time for division and fighting among themselves, although there was some of that, but it was mitigated. The sacrifices, the assemblies, the teaching, the moving, and so on and so forth, kept them busy in the positive practice of religious service. It was on purpose. It was on purpose. Secondly, this lifestyle reinforced their dependence on God. They never needed new clothes. The Bible says that their sandals never wore out. God provided water in the desert. He provided food in the desert. He provided protection in the desert, direction in the desert. Their entire devotion to Him was meant to emphasize their dependency on Him. Their situation was one of utter helplessness and yet each day God reminded them of His ability to care for all of their needs. And so each day their dependence on Him was reinforced and confirmed through their continual survival. We survived another day, why? Because God provided for us the things we needed in this impossible, in this impossible place. And then this lifestyle also provided a very important witness. They didn't mingle with the pagan nations around them, but that was not to say that these nations didn't notice them. How could you not notice millions of people wandering around you know, 30, 40 miles from your borders? The pagans could easily see the difference between themselves and this very strange nation that wandered in the desert year after year after year. They saw something special when they compared their continuous worship, when they saw their devotion and total dependence on one single God who provided everything. 
I mean, they were observing this, this unusual group mass of people and, and how they lived. When they saw their dedication to the festivals and their pure lifestyle and their total integration of daily living and religious practice seamlessly in one lifestyle. And when they compared, they saw that these people were not only different, they were like no other people that they had ever seen ever before. And so their religion was not part of their lives, it was their life. And this was a witness unlike any that they had ever seen before. It was truly, you know, the Bible says, the light in a dark place. They were truly a light unto the Gentiles that observed them from year to year. They had never seen anything like this before. Now, the mistake that we make sometimes in Bible study is that we think because the New Testament is the pattern for our lives and our service to the Lord, that somehow the Old Testament doesn't have any relevance for us. You know? I've actually heard people say in a Bible class, well, you know, God in the Old Testament, well, He's different than He is in the New Testament. God in the Old Testament was like legal, he was a legalist, and now in the New Testament, well, he's full of grace and mercy, you know. I mean, I've heard people say that and think that. But we know, of course, that God is the same today as he was yesterday. He doesn't change in character. It's the same God that the Jews were worshiping is the God that we worship, that we offer our prayers to. He hasn't changed his character. In the same way, what God wanted from His people in the Old Testament has not changed in essence for His people of the New Testament. I, I want to repeat that just in case you were not paying attention. What God wanted from the people that we read about in the Old Testament, He wants exactly the same thing from us. Exactly the same thing, no different. What has changed is that now, through Jesus Christ, we are actually able to do what the people in the Old Testament only hoped to be able to do. That's the big difference. The culture has changed, the geography has changed, the society has changed, technologies have changed. But as far as God's people are concerned, the Lord still requires of us today, here in Choctaw, America, what he demanded of the Jews as they wandered in the desert. Same thing, exactly the same thing. You might be wondering, well, what exactly was he asking of them? Well, first of all, he wanted from them and still wants from us a people that separate themselves from the world. He wants that. If you don't believe me, flip over to Romans chapter 12, will you please? Look at a couple of scriptures. Have your Bibles handy. I don't have uh, overheads tonight. We're going to have to do it the old school way. Just look at the scriptures themselves. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse one. Paul says to the church, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Watch now, punchline is in verse two. He says, and do not be conformed to this world. Let me ask you something. If Moses would have said exactly the same thing to the Jews in the desert, do not be conformed to this world. Do you think it would have meant something different you know, theologically and spiritually to the Jews in the desert as it means to us today? Absolutely not. They lived in a different kind of world, but not being of the world meant the same thing to them as it means to us today. What does he say? and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. By your conduct, you demonstrate 
what the will of God is. Is that any different from what God said to the Jews in the Old Testament? By your conduct you will demonstrate what the will of God is? The Jews were separated from the pagan nations by the desert and by their many laws and customs. We are separated from the world by the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what separates us from the world. The Jews were pilgrims escaping from Egyptian slavery and traveling through the desert on their way to a promised land. Well, guess what? We as Christians have escaped slavery to sin and we live as pilgrims in this world as we travel to what? As we travel to the heavenly promised land. We're on the same journey as they are. The geography has changed, but the pilgrimage is exactly the same. And God expects us to be His exclusive people, separate and apart from the world. He expected it from the Jews, and He expects it from us as well. I dare say that it's probably more difficult for us today because the world has so many ways to intrude into our lives. You know, one of the problems, we always say, what's the problem in the church? You know, what's the problem in the church? Well, the problem in that there's too much of the world in the church. That's the problem in the church. The more we get the world out of the church, the better the church is. Another thing that God still wants today, as He did then, God still wants us to wholly depend on Him one day at a time. This time, go back to Matthew chapter six, if you'd like to read with me. Again, familiar passages. Chapter six, verse 19, excuse me, verse nine rather. This is where Jesus is teaching His apostles to pray. Listen to what He says. He says, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily, our daily bread. What did I say before? What does God want? He wants us to wholly depend on Him one day at a time. He doesn't send manna anymore from heaven, that's true. He no longer draws water from rocks or clothing that doesn't wear out for 40 years, that's true. But He still provides a job, doesn't He? And doesn't He provide a home? And doesn't He provide a vehicle and everything else that we need? Do we actually think because these are modern conveniences that in some way God is not the one providing them? that we're able to believe that God could provide manna and water from a rock, but somehow we provide for ourselves a house and a car and a job and food? Is that what we think? You know, one thing that hasn't changed is that God provides for physical and emotional needs one day at a time. Back then, you know, remember? He provided the manna. How much, how much manna were you allowed to collect? Just for one day. There was a lesson there. And there's a lesson for us today as well. He provides not just physical, but He also provides emotional and spiritual energy to live, to deal with the things we have to deal with, but we only get one day's portion at a time. I don't get emotional strength for a week I get emotional strength for one day. I don't get spiritual strength for a month, you know, like in a bank or something. I get spiritual strength for one day. You know why? Because today is the only day that I'm alive. And what do we do often? Well, we take that emotional and spiritual energy and we invest it in worrying about tomorrow, if we will have enough. If we're going to make it, you know, we just, we take that energy and we invest it in tomorrow. Or we take that energy and we waste it by regretting yesterday. So what happens? We got nothing left for today. Why? We've invested it all in tomorrow. 
and into the future, what will happen, and if this, and if that, and so on and so forth. Instead of investing what he's given us to deal with today's issues, today. Tomorrow, tomorrow is another day. You know, those who dedicate themselves to storing up riches or building bigger barns as a substitute for living one day at a time usually forfeit their peace of mind and they risk forfeiting their souls. Do you really think if your house is paid off and you got 200 grand in your, in your bank account for your retirement, do you really think that that is your security? Really? Is that what you think? I mean, that may demonstrate that you've been a good steward, of course, but do you really think that that is your safeguard? Don't you know that with just a little something like a virus that you can't even see, all of that could be wiped away in a week or in a day or three days? Our wealth and materialism, it tends to hide the fact that God is the source of our blessings. God is the source of our good life. But God still requires His people to depend totally on Him for everything, every single day. And you know what? I have news for you. This is going to be the way it's going to be forever. Do you think do you think there will ever come the moment when we are not dependent on God totally? Do you think when this life is over and we're in heaven, we're going to be able to say, okay God, I'm good now, sin is past, you know, I made it into the kingdom of heaven, I'm good to go, you know, I'll see ya. The sooner we accept the fact that we are dependent on God, every moment into eternity, the sooner we understand that, the sooner we begin to experience what the Bible calls a peace that surpasses understanding. See, the understanding part, that's the part where you can count stuff. I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that, therefore I must be okay. Peace, on the other hand, is that experience where you don't have to count. It's not about the things you have, it's about who you know and who you're depending on. My peace is based on the fact that I depend on someone who can provide for me into eternity. A third way that God still desires the same things. This time in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God still wants His people to be ambassadors. You know, Paul is saying, we appeal to people as ambassadors, we are the ambassadors for Christ. When the Jews were in the desert, they embodied the truth and presence of God to that dark world. Isaiah said that these people would provide a light unto the Gentiles in bringing the Savior to the world, Isaiah 49, uh, verse six. In those days, they were the only way that unbelievers could know God's truth and see God at work in a people. There was no other way, there was no other place, there were no other people. If you didn't see it in the Jewish people, you didn't get to see it. It wasn't there. If you ignored the witness of God as it was presented in those people, then you wouldn't find it anywhere else. There was no you know, alternative view of God. That was it. Today, this role is given to Christians. Same role given to the church. We're the ambassadors for Christ to the world. I want to ask you something. Who is going to project Christ to the world? Walmart? The American military, as great as it is? Google? Amazon? The Chinese government? Who is going to project the image of Christ in this world. Who? Well, us. If we don't do it, no one else has been given 
that responsibility. Our calling card is the gospel, our embassy is the church, our government is the kingdom of God, our credibility and effectiveness is dependent on our holy living in obedience to Christ. We look very different than the Jews did, but we are still responsible for delivering the Christ to the world. And if the world doesn't see Him in us, it won't see Him anywhere else. Now, I'm not responsible for the Chinese people seeing Christ. Well, maybe Hal and I through you know, Bible talk, there may be some people downloading stuff in China, but you know what I'm saying. Here in Choctaw, we're responsible for these people here. These people, they're the ones who are going to see Christ in us. There are others that God has in China, in Germany, whatever, to project Christ. We're responsible for what happens here in our generation. Now the Old Testament shows that the Jews, you know, they failed at living as God's people. They broke out of the circle that God had created for them and they mingled with the pagan nations to a point where they joined in their sins. They grew to depend on their own wisdom and they took kings over themselves and they relied on armies and gold and diplomacy. Whoa, wait a minute, I am talking about the Jews, you know, <laughs> not us. We would never do that, would we? Depend on the economy, depend on the military, depend on diplomacy. Would we ever do that for our safety, for our confidence? What happened to the Jews? It led to their ruin. They stopped being representatives for God and they began practicing empty ritualism to feed their pride, which ultimately led to their rejection of the Savior when He finally came. The only thing that God put them on the earth for, they missed, they missed it. Their desert experience was recorded so we can learn some lessons about our own pilgrimage today as God's people. And some of the more obvious and necessary lessons from the desert are the following, and I'll share these and the lesson can be yours for, for this time. One of the lessons is this, let's remain closed to the sinful world, shall we? Can I get an amen on that? Let us remain closed to the, spirit, to the sinful world around. Let's keep out the dirt and the disbelief that would break the circle of faith that we have with the Lord and His church. Let's do that. Let's not compromise, shall we? I, I, I used to enjoy when our children were small and they would you know, later on, you know how your kids do, they tell you stories that you didn't know as they were growing up, you know, mom and dad were kind of clueless and then as they get older they say, you know mom or dad, that time this thing happened, I never told you what, you know what I'm talking about. Our, some stuff you don't want to know, right? Some stuff you're saying, no, no, please. But the ones that I really enjoyed is when you know, one of our children would say, oh, I was over at my friend's house and they were all planning the big evening, they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And one of our children who were part of that thing would say, oh, I'm sorry, are you kidding me? My mother will never, <laughs> she'll never allow me to do that. Or one of our sons would tell us that he had told his friends, uh, yeah, sounds like a good plan, but I, I'm going to have to figure a way to do this because there's no way that my dad will say, you know, allow me to sleep over, over at so and so place or go away for you know, some crazy thing you know, that apparently their parents allowed but they say, oh no. Or if one of their friends was bragging on how they talked to their parents, talked back to their parents and said, well, you, know, you don't know nothing and you just shut up and leave me alone, you know? And our kids would say, oh my goodness. They go, oh, if I ever said to my mother, shut up, I wouldn't get the up part out of my mouth before my dad would be on me, you know, choking me to death. And they laughed about it. But what a good witness that was to their friends. Inadvertently, they were making a witness. In our family, there's just some stuff that will not, <laughs> it just won't fly. Let's do that, shall we? 
Let's keep that as a church. And let's remain like children, totally dependent every day on our Heavenly Father for what we need, from jobs to spouses to an idea of to what to cook for supper. Let's not be too proud to say, you know, God, I, I just need your help for some little tiny thing here, and I'm not too proud to say, help me in this. Let's remain close to Him for every single big or little thing in our lives and live those lives just one day at a time. One day. Do we have to really, in this church, with all these prayer requests, do we really have to remind each other how fleeting life is? How many of our brothers and sisters, healthy and strong, one week and then the very next week, fighting for their lives, their entire life upside down because of cancer or accident? You know, do we have to even think about this twice? Do we have to become mortally ill in order to learn the lesson that we should only live one day at a time because all these people that I talk to who are mortally ill in our congregation, that's the one thing they all say, well I sure am living one day at a time now because for some they can't see past next week, the doctors haven't given them past next week, they're just saying well let's, let's take care of today and let's get through today and we'll see what tomorrow. Why can't we live like that when we're well? And then finally, let's continue being very different. Different in the quality of our conduct. Different in the purity of our lives. Different in our dedication to the church and its needs and its work and its worship. I always, you know, when, when we go and do a seminar on church growth or something, I always tell you know, I get invited to churches, not huge churches, I get invited to small churches who want to get bigger. And the first thing I always tell them is, God is not more or less pleased with a big or little church, He's all about a faithful church. Your goal is not to be big, your goal is to be faithful. So if you've got 50 people in your church but only 12 of them show up for worship, God is not pleased. You are not providing a witness of faithfulness. Do you get the point? If you got 400 in your church and only 200 show up for worship, then you're not being faithful. You're not providing a witness to the neighbors. I know that it's because of the time thing. You know, we start services at a certain time and across the street they start services at another time, perhaps earlier than we do, but it's always a little disconcerting for me to arrive here at, you know, I get here early on Sunday morning at nine o'clock, and their parking lot, they got 200 cars, and our parking lot, we have two cars. And I know it's because they, you know, they have another service, but still, I always wonder about people driving by, you know, who are not church members, who are thinking, I know what's going on in that church, but what's going on in that church? Let's be different, so different that even if others disagree or even disdain us, there will be no doubt in their minds as to our absolute devotion to Jesus Christ and His church. I don't like Him, He gets on my nerves, but you know what? That guy sure loves God. Had the Jews learned these lessons, that generation would have made it to the promised land and their history would have been much different today. Well, every generation of Christians, as I say, repeats the exact same pilgrimage originally undertaken by these men and women in the Old Testament. And each generation succeeds or fails, believe it or not, for the very same reasons. So let us succeed in our generation. Let us arrive at our heavenly home by learning the lessons taught by those who didn't make it. What will the young people in our church, in our congregation, what will they say about our generation? These little children, five and six and eight years old and two years old that are even here tonight, what will they say about our generation? What it was like going to church with us? Were we different? Were we faithful? Were we dependable? 
Were we zealous in loving God and the things of God? Let's succeed in our generation and let's, let's carve out the path for the future so that the next generation will know how to succeed because we've taught them how to succeed. Dear Brother George that we buried just recently, didn't he carve out a marvelous path for his family and this church? I mean, till maybe just a few weeks before he passed away. He was still sending Bibles and correspondence courses to people. People were still being baptized because of Brother George and all the wonderful people that worked with him. What a marvelous testimony, right to the very end. A great witness for his children, for us, and for the generation that's following behind us. All I can say tonight is that you can join the pilgrimage to heaven if you haven't already done so. By confessing Christ, of course, and repenting of your sins, being lowered in the waters of baptism based on your faith in Christ, if that's what you need. Because some of you may simply be watching you know, the pilgrimage go by, but you're not in the pilgrimage. That's how you become part of that pilgrimage. And maybe, of course, some of you can rejoin it because you've kind of taken a detour somewhere along the line and you need to kind of get back with the group because you've wandered away because of unfaithfulness or sinfulness or secret sin or whatever it is. Either way, you can guarantee your safe arrival by coming to Christ this evening and taking the lessons from the desert to heart. So if you need to, respond to this invitation that I'm making to you tonight through this lesson, then of course we encourage you to do that now as Johnny leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand and sing, please?